Welcome to the American Hospital Association special podcast series, Just Lead, a look at how hospitals and health systems that have been recognized with AHA awards for innovation, collaboration, and health equity are transforming healthcare to better serve their communities. Each is turning to a different approach for patient care. The American Hospital Association Quest for Quality Prize is presented annually to honor healthcare leadership and innovation in achieving high quality healthcare and advancing health in communities. Hospitals and health systems are encouraged to apply for the 2023 Quest for Quality Prize by October 21st. Learn more at aha.org slash quest for quality. Today we are joined by a Citation of Merit honoree for AHA's 2022 Quest for Quality Prize. North Shore University Health System in Evanston, Illinois. Dr. Lakshmi Halasiyamani, Chief Clinical Officer for the North Shore Edward Elmhurst Health System, is speaking with Marie Cleary Fishman, Vice President of Clinical Quality at the AHA Center for Health Innovation. Let's join them. Well, Lakshmi, good morning. Thank you for joining me today to have this conversation about the amazing work you're doing at North Shore. Maybe you could start out by telling our listeners a little bit about North Shore University Health System. Sure. Uh, Thank you, Marie, for the opportunity to be part of this conversation today. North Shore University Health System is now expanded to be North Shore Edward Elmhurst Health. But the core initial for North Shore hospitals that make up North Shore University Health System are located in the Chicagoland area. But recently, over the last several years, we've grown, and we now include Swedish Hospital, Northwest Community Hospital, and Edward Elmhurst Health. However, our focus in pursuing the Quest for Quality Prize and the work that we shared really is focused on the work done at the four initial North Shore hospitals, which are known as North Shore University Health System. Well, that's really uh, interesting to hear and great news to hear about folks expanding and working together. I think that your quality journey really has been something to learn from and to really hear about the support you've given to your leadership in the organizations to apply the science of improvement to their clinical work is really something to learn from. And so I look forward to talking a little bit more about that. One of the things that was uh, apparent to me as I was reading over material um, is that your president and CEO, J.P. Gallagher, has really supported this. Can you talk just a little bit about the support that your organization gets from the top leadership? Sure, absolutely. And and I think what's incredibly important is improvement it has to be part of your uh, DNA. It has to be part of what you wake up to aspire to do every day. And as one of my colleagues once mentioned to me years ago, when you're coasting, you're going downhill. So you have to ask yourself each day, what can we do better? How do we better serve our communities? And that requires a willingness to examine what isn't going well. I think frequently leaders are comfortable and probably become too complacent in um, celebrating things that are going well because it's more uncomfortable to look at the areas that we really need to improve. So having that support to critically examine what needs to be better for our communities, for our team members, for our patients, Uh, is incredibly important for our senior leadership as well as our board of directors to help us feel that we can critically examine our opportunities to make care better. That's a great philosophy, and I love that uh, this is part of your DNA. I guess that applies every time I walk from the first floor to the basement at home and think about all the things I can do on the way there. I think it's in my (laughs) DNA having been in that role for so long. But let's let's really get on to the what we want to talk about today, and that is the focus of your award, really talking about your health equity impact team and how you see that having been embedded in the culture and how have you built that to be part of the DNA of your organization? Sure. And, um, and Marie, this is something that we're very proud of, but I'll also acknowledge that we're at the beginning of this journey. So as we talked about and thought about how do we engage Um, in health equity, we were very concerned that it would become a standalone or add-on sort of approach, as opposed to asking the question whether everything we're doing is equitable. 
And in order for us to really shape this journey, we needed to include individuals from our own teams that came from diverse backgrounds. I think oftentimes we try to solve things in conference rooms with individuals that aren't as deeply connected to the work and understand the challenges. So we engaged the organization, assembled a very diverse group of individuals, probably about 25 people from all different walks of life and different leadership and non-leadership frontline positions within the organization. And the first thing we asked was, what was their experience of care within North Shore? And what did they aspire for that experience to be? Then we began to really set out a set of key milestones that we needed to achieve. We realized we needed to learn from others. We also realized we needed to understand what our data said about us. So we spent some time really with our analytics team, understanding the data that we had, and we had to get comfortable with the fact that the information that we had was incomplete. And sometimes when we have incomplete information, we can say, oh, well, I guess we can't really do anything about it. However, as a clinician, you know, we sometimes have to work with incomplete information to come up with the best answer for that patient or that situation. So again, in engaging a group, we asked ourselves, what are the insights that are actionable? Where do we want to begin? appreciating that wherever we begin is not necessarily where we end. And that allowed us to start. It allowed us to understand gaps in accessing breast cancer um, screening. It helped us understand opportunities in collecting race, ethnicity, and language data more accurately. And it helped us understand gaps in patients who we were asking to fill out HCAP surveys, which is obviously a very common survey that's filled out after a hospitalization. But we were finding that our individuals who were black and brown really didn't even fill them out. And we had to understand why. So I think what this journey taught us is we don't always know what the problems are. And the only way to embark on solutions is to have clarity in the problems that we're trying to solve. There are some really important points in what you just said. And I just wanna call them out a little bit for our listeners because I think you have just landed on things that are so important. So the first is really thinking about our old friend, uh, Donna Bedian, who really said in quality, we mm -hmm. have to look at structure, process, and then the outcome. And so you've really looked at the structure and the people that you've pulled together and then look at your processes and then desired outcome. The other thing that you've mentioned that I have not thought about before, but that is that the gaps in data are mm -hmm. actually a form of data in and of themselves. And so rather than us getting frustrated and feeling like we can't do something because we don't have the data, looking at those gaps as data and coming up with solutions around that, as you talked about in your breast cancer screening and you talked about your black and brown community, maybe not filling out the survey, those things are really important. And I love that. I mean, that's a, a focus that I think we in the field of quality need to call out more and more and really, really focus on that. Yeah. And I think sometimes we wait to do anything until we have more complete information. And I think that's a missed opportunity because um, there's usually insights that even the, the incomplete data tells us. And that's where having a diverse group of in individuals examine those insights as a group is incredibly helpful, right? So if you can imagine that we're all watching different parts of a movie. And obviously we don't have the full movie, but if a whole bunch of us watch them together, we probably have different insights than if only one person looked at you know, different parts of a movie. So the way I think about it is, it's gonna take time to fill in all of these gaps, but we don't have time to wait to address issues of inequity. So we're gonna to have to use what we have. As my mother says, you have to make dinner with what's in your pantry. You can't like wish for <laughs> ingredients that you don't have. And yeah. you know, you can probably make something pretty good, right? I mean, people are so hungry and you can't say, I'm sorry, I don't have, you know, truffle oil because I can't make dinner. No, <laughs> you've got plenty in your pantry to, to do something with that. So I, I think it is about stepping into a little bit of unknown, but when you step into that space with a group of people, you're less likely to fall off the cliff, right? The ground may not be totally stable, but now that everyone's looked at it, we have some ideas of where we might want to begin. That's fabulous. I love that. I, uh, I, I, think, I think thinking about these things in our real world really helps because I think we, we try, and I'm one of those perfectionist people where if I don't have everything together, then I 
get frustrated, but I think that applying the science of quality improvement, science of improvement, and thinking about it in real life ways helps break down some of those barriers and, and that we set up for ourselves. So I love your your way of thinking and your your philosophy about quality in general. Yeah, the, the other dimension I would also say was really important is we engaged our community members because again, when you're trying to solve something like you know, let's improve breast cancer screening in communities of color or communities that are under-resourced, you can imagine that you know why those rates are different, and you might not. And, and the people who do know oftentimes live and work in those communities. So we did assemble a group of community members to help us really understand, to partner with us, to first ask, do you think getting improvement in breast cancer screening is important for your community? Because again, oftentimes health systems can be very paternalistic um, and say, well, we think it's good. So if we think it's good, it must be good. Versus sort of starting with, hey, here's some gaps that we see in care. Which of these resonate with you and where would you like to partner with us to begin this journey of reducing inequities in care? That's awesome. Really thinking about that, what matters, you know, we also work with the John A. Hartford Foundation and age-friendly health systems and, and through the four mm -hmm. M's, and one of those M's is the what matters. And looking through that what matters lens makes all the difference in the world. I even do that every day with my 90-year-old father at home, you know, and think about <laughs> yeah. how I help him have a healthy, productive life. And, you know, we've gotten to a great place thinking about well, what matters to him and what matters to me? And we've come to a mutual agreement that his safety and well-being is what matters to both of us, you know, so it really helps. Yeah. And I think that we've talked in the past about voice of the customer, but really focusing on that what matters, what is really important to a community or to an individual? And we in healthcare have to worry about both, right? We take care of individuals, but those individuals build together to create a community. And so I think that's so important that you reach out and, and really hear what matters to that community you're serving through those individuals. Love it. That's that's fabulous. A absolutely. Not only do we hear, but we then have to listen, right? Because that right. may change what we were thinking we might do. And we all get very wedded to our actions. And we have to be willing to pause and say, hmm, before we do anything, let's make sure we're listening and getting the feedback we need. Couldn't agree with you more. This work makes me very excited. <laughs> I love Thank it. You. Thank you for that. <laughs> I want to really make sure we get to cover some of the details of this awesome work you're doing, and that includes North Shore's Community Investment Fund. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so as we were leaning into um, really better understanding our opportunities in health equity, we also realized that we had an opportunity to support our communities in improving our the well-being of the of the individuals we take care of. Because again, we all know this, we all know that having good health is more than about being able to go to the doctor. It's about having access to good food, living in safe environments, having economic security, being able to address issues of mental health and addiction. And we realized that, you know, as a health system, we're going to need others to partner with us. And how could we support those organizations in their work and in their core mission? And so with that, really, we gave birth to the Community Investment Fund, which is a significant corpus of dollars that the organization has, and the interest of which is used to award grants to organizations in the community. Now, you can imagine that we've, we've just started this work. So we've, we're now in our second cycle of, of um, looking at applications and distributing these funds. We, we want to have it be an accelerant, right? So if there's areas that uh, we see a health need that has an adjacency to a different um, area of focus that a community organization has, maybe that accelerates our our aligned outcomes. So if we want to address obesity or we want to address mental health, that's not going to be solved by any organization alone. So how can we begin to think about making investments that get us all rowing in the same direction and really compounding our impact? So the idea of the Community Investment Fund is to serve as an accelerant in the community and to support wonderful initiatives that other organizations are leading that are aligned with our broader purpose of advancing health for everyone. 
that's another important piece of structure that you've built in there. So with all of that that we've talked about, let's get to some outcomes. Can you give me some idea of the kind of impact that the investment fund has had on the community and talk about some of the amazing outcomes you've had? Yeah, so so I would say that we've already seen our breast cancer rates improve in our under-resourced communities. We now have access points for healthcare and for food, for even understanding how to use the U.S. healthcare system within um, community organizations and access points. So, so we've now begun to create a dialogue, um, and we no longer say, well, food insecurity isn't a health system issue. Of course, we know it is. However, the health system probably needs the food banks and others in the community to help solve that. So how do we begin to inform each other? So some of our advances have been around structure, including community organizations in the improvement work, defining it and helping clarify what our aims uh, and the drivers of those aims are from the beginning. So again, back to Donna Bibian, some of the processes, how do we make sure that our abilities to connect to organizations are seamless and that we're all even aware of what each other is doing. I think one of our really important insights is oftentimes good people who are doing wonderful work have no idea what's going on in the community in other areas. And so how do we create a directory or a repository or be able to create a network of connections that really, again, helps accelerate what it is we're each trying to do individually? And then finally, when we think about outcomes, some of those outcomes are short-term. Are we improving breast cancer rates? Are we improving access to um, medications, access to food? And there are definitely positive in impacts there. But when we think about what our global goal is, our goal is to is to impact things like life expectancy that is different in different neighborhoods and different census tracts. How are we going to do that? That's not a one-year proposition. That's probably a generational commitment. So as we build our structures, understand our processes, I think the outcomes will come, but it's going to require patience. And I think frequently we're very attached to, tell me something you did, you know, six months later, well, this is not a crash diet. This is about a way of life. It's a way of life that says we are permanently, we are forever connected to our communities. Our communities shape us. We shape the community. We want to change that arc. You know, what did Martin Luther King say? The arc of history is long, but bends towards justice. You know, I would say the arc of health is long, but hopefully bends towards greater well-being and equity for everyone. And if we believe that, then that means the investments we make, the way that we connect with each other, and our desire to really understand that some of these problems are very complex and interrelated is going to take time. Absolutely. And I, I love that. And, and certainly we want to make sure that we understand it's a journey. I'm going to quote you, <laughs> Lakshmi, the, that I have in front of me, and that is the role of the ATI T team is to interdigitate, which is a fabulous word, a lot of initiatives because, because health equity has to be part of the fabric of what we do in the organization, not something that stands all by itself. And I think that right. your words are fabulous and uh, we'll have to do some quotes to put around the organizations because I think they're, they're fabulous. They're really, really great. So we have talked about a lot of amazing um, concepts and amazing work today. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us about your work or the work of the organization? You know, I, I think the last thing I would just share is that there's probably nothing more imp important than a commitment to continuously improving. Um, and the reason I say that is because it's not a linear journey. It's a journey that has setbacks. It's a journey that has advances, journey that goes sideways. But what it taps into is our desire for things to be better. Um, and as we think about, you know, what better looks like, we have to ask ourselves, you know, is everyone at the table? And if they're not, how do we make the table bigger? I think one of the biggest challenges we have right now in society is that we are looking, we are making, our worlds are getting too small. We're believing that the table is a fixed size, but really the table has to expand. And in that expansion, there's greater insights, there's greater opportunities and ways for us to uh, to improve. So, so I think as we think about healthcare, the fundamental ethos has to be about improving um, and, and committing to that for the long term. 
So, you know, like every other relationship in our life, it has its ups and downs. But when you think about the most loving relationships you have, you're committed to them. I think, you know, think about what you just said about your dad, right? You're committed to, to his safety and well-being. There's going to be days where that's better, days where that's worse, probably days where you disagree. But you know what? You're committed. And I think that's what we have to live out each day as we enter into whatever space of healthcare that we are privileged to participate in. Very, very wise words. Thank you so much. I think, I think, uh, as I, I will just say, um, you know, having been with my dad and and living with him now since my mom passed away in 2017, that has given me so much insight and so much to pull from for my own personal journey. And I think one of the things that sometimes we talk about is separating worlds of professional and mm-hmm. personal lives. And I would really just encourage folks that if you have personal experiences you're going through, those things shape who you are and they really shape the way you think about things. And Lakshmi, I can hear so much of the compassion and love and caring for the work that you do. And I really want to thank you for that and um, really appreciate it as I live my own journey with my dad, which has been a fabulous one with lots of humor and lots of frustration and lots of love uh, through it. So, but I think that that makes us it's it's sort of why we went into healthcare. Um, I'm a nurse, and you know, spent a lot of time in quality, and so I love the modeling that you're doing and the the journey that you're setting forth for the folks that you work with in your organization. So thank you for sharing it with us. We really appreciate your time and all of your energy and the great work being done by the North Shore University Health System and the the new folks that I'm sure that you will uh, get a chance to work with as well. So. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for all of the great work. And uh, it's been such a pleasure talking to you this morning.